An alternating series. So the summation of negative 1 to the n, I'm going to switch it to k just because we've been using k mostly. 1 plus k cubed over k to the fourth. Bless you. Thank you. So first thing we recognize is that it's an alternating series because of the switch. So we're going to use the alternating series test. And the alternating series test has two parts. Part one of the alternating series test is to take the limit of a sub k as k goes to infinity. And one thing we have to remember is that for an alternating series, a sub k is that. A sub k does not include the minus sign. So for us, we're going to have the limit of 1 plus k cubed divided by k to the fourth. And several ways you could do this limit. If you divide everything by k to the fourth, you're going to have 1 over k to the fourth plus 1 over k all divided by 1, this limit will be 0. So that's the first step. That's essentially the divergence test. The second part of the alternating series test, we want to show that this function is decreasing, which we can do using an algebra technique. So we want to show that the terms are getting smaller as we go to the right. And this one, I see that k to the fourth, and I'm immediately thinking, ooh, that could be a pain in the neck. Let's do it with calculus. So we want to show this. Let's use calculus, though. Let's not do the algebra way. So what that means is that we just have to show that that function is decreasing. So I look at that, and you know, if we put the k plus 1 in there, we're going to have to fourth power it out, which is a pain. So let's go ahead, and we're going to take the derivative of this function. We're gonna, we can forget about the switch. We don't need that. Uh, and I'll switch it to x's just because. So then we take our derivative. It's a quotient. So we will have low times the derivative of the numerator plus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. And all of that is divided by the denominator squared. Question, why do we have to take the derivative of it again? Uh, the derivative being negative will show us that it's decreasing. So we're trying to show that a sub k is decreasing, which we can do using this algebra technique where we plug in k plus 1 and then compare it to k, and then we cross multiply usually. But this has a k to the 4, so if we put a k plus 1 in there, we have to multiply that all out, which uh, is a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, low d high minus high d low. Thank you. Great question answer because I'm tired. <laughs> so yeah, so you better be alert today. OK, so that's going to be 3x to the 6 minus 4x cubed minus 4x to the 6. And that's all over x to the 8th. <coughs> And when we do our simplification here, we get negative x to the 6 minus 4x cubed. And this is x to the 8th in the denominator. And that is a negative number. If you wanted to factor out the negative in the numerator, you would have that. And we're taking the limit as x goes to infinity. So we're imagining plugging in positive numbers here. So this is less than 0. Therefore, uh, decreasing. 
And that tells us that we have convergence by AST since both we've shown that both those properties are true. That the limit is zero and the terms are going to zero. That the limit is zero and that the terms are decreasing. All right, so now the next thing with an alternating series is to say, if it converges, does it converge absolutely or conditionally? So to answer that question, to, to classify the type of convergence, we need to consider the series where we get rid of the switch and we just have this. And the question is, does that series converge or diverge? And what do you think what you get? Diverges? What do you think, Anna? What's the power in the numerator? Power in the denominator is 4. So if we imagine taking away the insignificant part of the numerator, what would that reduce to? Perfect. So we'll do a comparison here. So we're going to say, OK, well, let's let b sub k be 1 over k. And that's leading us to the harmonic. So that diverges because it's harmonic. So then our suspicion is that a sub k, the a sub k series, also diverges. So we are going to want to show what relationship between a sub k and b sub k. Should a sub k be smaller or bigger than b sub k? A sub k should be smaller, bigger, below, right? So b sub k diverges. So we would want to show oh, that a sub k opposite. is bigger, yeah, bigger. Yeah. right? Because bigger than diverging will diverge, smaller than converging will converge. So we, that's what we would want to show. If we're going to be able to show the direct comparison test, that's what we would want to be able to show. So let's see. Let's plug in the left side. So that's 1 plus k cubed over k to the fourth. Question, is that bigger than 1 over k? Now intuitively, we know that it's going to work out because b to the k is really k to the 3 over k to the 4. So this numerator is going to be bigger than that numerator. A bigger numerator means a bigger value. So the math should pan out just fine. We can figure it out by cross multiplying. And we get there really, really fast. The k to the 4s are going to cancel. We get k is greater than zero, and that's true. So that tells us, therefore, the convergence is, or I didn't finish the conclusion here. So therefore, what's true about this series right here? So this diverges. So we've shown that the a sub k series is bigger than a divergent series here. So that means that, therefore, we have divergence for that. And that tells us that the original convergence for the alternating series is conditional. conditional. So therefore, conditional convergence, not absolute. Question, what does harmonic mean again? Harmonic is 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. Oh. It's, oh. Right, that's our. That's our uh, sort of fundamental diverging series. It's got terms that go to zero, but it, nonetheless it diverges. So the harmonic is our comparison series for all sorts of other when we're testing. So we know that that series diverges. The harmonic. Does that That's right. That's yeah. I, I went, yeah, I tried to use I used that step at the start, like mm -hmm. what you just did, and I said it diverged, and they said it converged, and I didn't read that it was conditional convergence. Yes. So I was like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, so the series of absolute values diverges, but the series with the negatives 
convergence. And then that series with the negatives, the alternating series, converges conditionally because we need the negatives. Without the negatives, we get divergence. Okay. All right, let's take a peek at this other one. So that one looks like, um, what test do you think we want to use for that one? Root test. The root test is a perfect choice because we've got that root or that power on the outside and the root test will take it away. So let's go ahead and look at that. So we're going to take the, so rho will be the limit of the kth root of all this. So that kth root operation is just going to reduce all this to 8 to the k square root of k minus 8 to the 2. We want to take the limit of that as k goes to infinity. And what is that limit? No. Yes. So, <laughs> were you here Tuesday? No, no, that was the day. Yeah, that was the day here. Yeah. So that's why. Okay. So we showed on Tuesday this important fact, which is not intuitive. The limit of the kth root of k as k goes to infinity is equal to? One. one. So this is a super important fact that if you don't have that, you could easily miscalculate. So we showed that the limit of the kth root of k is 1 by using the log limit thing. Right? We took the natural log, you know, we did the whole log limit thing. And we showed that that's true. So now we have that at our disposal. And the limit symbol can come inside here. And we're basically plugging in. We're, we're, we're thinking of, um, so the, Unless we're misinterpreting this. So th this k is k3 to k, right? A to the power k. You sure? I'm pretty, pretty sure. sure. That's a root of k. Yeah. So the a root k? It's the k3 to k. Yeah. Oh, that's where I got messed up. Yeah, that, that, I, uh, when I just looked back at my writing there, I intuitively knew that they were talking about k3 to k. But when you first told it to me, I think I wrote it as a to the k. Yeah, I was like. Yeah, yeah, but it's 8 to the k. I thought I saw down your notes and I was like, what? I don't get this. So, like, so if it's 8 to the k, definitely would diverge. If it was oh, 8 to the k. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's k through to k. I was like, that was an easy one. I was like, you can't do that easy. It's like, there's something weird. Something's going on. So when we take the limit here, we get 8 minus 8, which is 0. And for the root test, less than 1 converges. Group test, ratio test, geometric series, less than one. All right, let's go to our new stuff. Well, no, we have to finish up 10-8, eight, eight, and then we go to our new stuff. I can't believe we're going to hit power series today. So I think we are there. Did we finish this? Or no, where are we at? So we finished this slide. OK, so some rando series to analyze. First off, what do we think intuitively? Converge or diverge? Does that sign function as a switch? Like the it will not function as a switch because there's no multiplier in there to force it to be negative 1 or positive 1. So it's definitely creating, so just the sign part, there's going to be some positives, some negatives in there. But what about if we add 5 to it? So this numerator is going to just be a, a number somewhere between 4 and 6. Right? So the numerator is just bounce around between 4 and 6, but the denominator is going to infinity. So the values are going to 0, but they're going to 0 in a p-series way, right? 
in a P series, in a divergent P series way. If we look at that, what's true about this series? P is less than one, so it diverges. P is less than one, so it diverges. Correct. So our hunch is that it probably diverges. So now the next thing is that can we get the direct comparison to work here? Hmm. Well, we would want to show that our series is bigger than the divergent series that we have right there. And will that work? Let's see. So 5 sync, 5 plus sync. Oh, I see. Question, Jeff? Did you use the limit comparison? You could use limit comparison. So k would be 1 over k, is the sign is like this one is the constant from there? We, yes, absolutely. We can, we can you, we, the limit comparison test would work, we would use 1 over root k though. Yeah. So yes, limit comparison test root. will also work totally fine. Right. If we just move the root k over, that becomes 1, and 5 plus 6 is always the root 1. That's right. So the, well, these, these guys just cancel, correct? And so then we subtract, and we have sine of k. Is that bigger than negative 4? Yeah. Sine of k is ranging between negative 1 and 1. So this is true. So this will show us um, that we have divergent, diverge, so we have diverged then. Because we've shown bigger than, <laughs> bigger than divergent is divergent. <laughs> One of those days, one of those weeks. <coughs> Bigger than diverging is diverging. Does that make sense to everybody? Now this one is going to be a little more, a little trickier. So same basic scenario. We know that the numerator is just bouncing around between two and four because cosine is negative one at the least and positive one at the most. So the most we'll subtract off is 1. The most we'll add is 1. So it's going to be between 2 and 4. And that denominator is growing real fast. So yeah, we know it's going to converge. But check this out. So if we choose our b sub k um, to be equal to 1 over k cubed, this is corresponding to the series 1 over k cubed. And like you're all thinking, p is 3, which is bigger than 1, which means converge. OK, but our problem is we would need to show less than to get to convergence. That's what we would want to show. So we would want to show that a sub k is less than b sub k. And we're not going to be able to do that, because this numerator is bigger. So we have two choices. We can do what John suggested. We could go to the limit comparison test. Or we could fiddle with our b sub k, because the, b sub, the problem is the numerator. This numerator gets as big as 4. So what we could do is be kind of sneaky and say, hey, well, what about if we just make this 5 over k cubed? Still, it still converges. Multiplying a convergent series by a constant doesn't change anything. It still converges. And this inequality we will be able to show. It's going to play out just like the last one. We're going to have the k cubes are just going to cancel. <coughs> so those k cubes cancel. We subtract 3 from those sides. We get cosine of 5k less than 2. Yeah. Cosine bounces around between negative 1 and 1, so it's certainly less than 2. That is true. So therefore, converge by direct comparison test. Now, if you didn't see that that was going to work, then you certainly could jump over to limit comparison test. This is the other option. You 
could go to limit comparison test, you would take the limit of a sub k. Oh, oh, this might actually be inconclusive. Let's find out. So we're doing the limit of a sub k divided by b sub k. Those cancel. And so we have just the limit of 3 plus cosine of 5k. Oh, interesting. What's true about this limit as k goes to infinity? Doesn't converge, so that doesn't exist. We can't, it doesn't go to zero, it doesn't go to infinity, it's just bouncing around as k is increasing. <coughs> cosine of 5x or 5k is just going. So actually, this is a good example where direct comparison works, but limit comparison doesn't. It's very rare to find that scenario. Usually, if direct comparison works, limit comparison also works. Pretty rare. I need to, I want to make a note of that. Good. Good to note that. Hmm. Question. I know with, um, like we went over some things where if it was not zero, then it was diverging. But then there's other questions where if it's... If what was not zero? Like the, the answer. Then, like, if it... If the limit was not zero? Um, not necessarily the limit. I, I think it was when we were going, like, it was earlier. I, I remember going through the homework, and it said because... Um, it is not zero, it is diverging. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the, the um, what do we call that test, folks? Divergence, Divergence test. Oh. So if it's like one or two or anything like that, then it's diverging, mm -hmm. it has to be zero? Yep. But if it's any other kind of test, then as long as it's not going to infinity, then it's not divergent? Mm, well, for geometric series ratio and retest, if the limit is two, it diverges. As long as that limit's bigger than one, you get divergence. Okay. If you get infinity for uh, root or ratio, it also diverges. Somebody just asked me for an example just the other day of a DCT that works with an LCT that doesn't. <clears throat> All right. So... Let's take a look at this one. What about a test there? When you look at that, is there a test that we might want to try for that? Root test seems really good because you've got that power of K on the outside. So let's see if that actually plays out like we suspect it to play out. So rho will be the kth, whoops, the limit of the kth root. Limit kth root of all of this mess. And you can cut, kind of cut to the chase too. Like you could bypass this step. So this will be the limit of k over k plus 2. That's inconclusive, right? It's inconclusive one. And that is 1. Inconclusive. That's right. Darn! We love the retest. So sad, inconclusive. So, let me ask you this. What does the limit of one plus a over k to the bk, what does that limit equal? E to the ab. So that's our basic kind of exponential limit. And doesn't this a sub k look a little? Let's check the divergence test here. Right, the divergence test. That looks a little bit that way. Well, here's a clever little trick. We could certainly do the log limit thing like we did a bunch of. 
take the log of both sides and take the limit. But what if we can massage it into this form here? Then we can cut to the chase. Well, do you agree with this? That this is the limit of, I'm, I'm just going to flip these and put a minus sign up in the exponent position. Do you agree with that? All right, minus sign, we'll just toggle it, flip it over. And what about distributing the k? So dividing the k into the numerator. So what is this limit? 1 over e to the 2. So this is going to be e to the negative 2, which is 1 over e squared. And what's our conclusion then? So that limit is not 0. Therefore, must diverge. So this is not equal to 0, which implies diverge by the divergence test. The divergence test says, if our terms aren't going to 0, the series diverges. And a bare minimum for convergence, you have to have the terms going to 0, bare minimum. So it's a necessary condition. So that'll tell us we get the divergence. Oh, so that's why like with other questions, like with the P series or with geometric series, that's not the final answer that has to be between like, or, or like over or under one, it's like the P or the R, but, but the terms of even like the P series and geometric have to be zero. Going to zero. If they're converging. Yes. Oh, okay, so yes. for all. All series. series. Okay. Yeah, for all series that converge, the terms are going to zero. And then for a bunch of series that diverge, the terms are going to zero also. They just don't go to zero fast enough. They're going to zero, though, just not fast enough. <clears throat> OK, let's see if we can try again, right? The gut is definitely go to root test, right? Because we see those powers of k there. So let's try it again. We are not. No fear. We're not dissuaded. Um, and let's just take the kth root before we even we'll just do it right away. So we have that. And what's the limit of 6 over k? As k goes to infinity. Zero. Zero. Converge or value diverge? Converge because that's less than 1. Yep. That's how we love our root test to unfold. That's the ideal scenario. <laughs> as soon as you get the, the one, it's panic time, right? Oh, no, I've got to try something different. All right. All right, any questions up to that point? All right, so let's look at our next pair. All right, why don't you all try number 47? And what test do you think you'll use? Ratio the test. Oh, OK. <laughs> use, the, uh, use the ratio test because there's a factorial. Anytime we have that factorial, go ratio test. That's how you get factorials to cancel out is with the ratio test. So see if you can use the ratio test here. And Gabe, you said your hunch is that it diverges? I, I didn't notice the four in the factorial. I thought it was k factorial over k factorials. Mm. I just missed almost all of that thing. <laughs> you can see the factorial in the denominator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot going on in that sum end. Can you just remind you of one thing. When you plug in the k plus 1, make sure that you don't go down the rabbit hole of not realizing this. And when you plug in that k plus 1, that 4 is inside the factorial. So that has to be distributed. So it's 4k plus 4 quantity factorial. 
See if you can get the cancellation to do what do what it needs to do. going through it, I write the first step up there just so you can check, make sure you're interpreting your a sub k plus 1 properly. Any questions on how you would deal with 4K plus 4 factorial? No questions on the bottom one. Yeah. On the bottom one? To the fourth part, yeah. Okay. So let's go look at the bottom then. We'll, so that 4K plus 4, we just have to do this repeated multiplication until we get to a convenient stopping position so that we can get some cancellation. So we're going to end up with, that's where we would stop. So we're going to do repeated subtraction of 1 until we can get, get some pairing with this term in the denominator over here. So let me just rewrite this numerator. And we'll have that. Okay, so the k plus 1 to the 4, factorial to the 4. So that's going to be broken apart like this. We're going to say that's k plus 1 times k factorial on the, in, k factorial on the inside. And that whole quantity is raised to the 4th. So we take the k plus 1 out. We're left with k factorial. And then what's going to happen is that, well, let's do it in the next step. So first off, let's cancel these two factors. And then in the numerator, we still have these four factors. And then we're going to get cancellation of the far right factor in a second. So here we have k plus 1 to the 4th times k factorial to the 4th when we distribute that exponent. And now we can get rid of that k factorial quantity to the 4th. That will cancel right there. OK, so now. The numerator is a polynomial, the denominator is a polynomial, 
And we know that the limit at infinity of a polynomial only depends on the first term. So all we have to do is figure out the first term for each of these polynomials. We do not have to FOIL it all the way out. We know that the first term in the numerator polynomial is that times that times that times that. That's the highest power for that numerator polynomial. So we know that we can write it as 256k to the 4. The highest power in the denominator is k to the 4. So if you have a quotient of polynomials and you're taking a limit at infinity, the only terms that matter are the two big terms. All the other terms go to zero. And what is that limit? 256. And what is our conclusion for the root, or whatever test we used? We used the ratio test. What's our conclusion? So this is bigger than 1, which means diverge. So bigger than 1, diverge for both root ratio and geometric. So that your k plus 1. So the one I had problems with was that uh, uh, k factorial to the fourth power. Mm -hmm. So you just do k plus 1 times k factorial yep. Yep. on anything like that? Yep, anytime we see. So if we have a k plus 1 factorial, we can always do this repeated subtraction of one thing and put in the factorial wherever we want. So we, okay. could, we could even go k plus 1 times k times k minus 1 factorial. We could do that. Okay. So we can drop the factorial in wherever we need it to go. So if we have 6 factorial, that's equal to 5, oops, 6 factorial, we could write it as 6 times 5 factorial, or we could write it as 6 times 5 times 4 factorial, we just drop it in wherever we need it, wherever it's convenient so that we get some cancellation. Okay. Question, in the denominator, how are we able to just split the k plus 1 uh, times k factorial up? In, from here to here? Yeah. So this is multiplication, and our multiplication properties say that if we have a product raised to a power, that power distributes to each of them. So if, is that just if they're functions? Or what if they're like regular integers? Still true. Okay. So if you like have 2 times 6 inside of like parentheses squared? Yep. Uh, or 2 times 3, or I guess that works too. Yep, then that would be this, which is 4 times 36, which is 144. Or, if you did, mul did that multiplication first, you would also get 144. Uh, okay. Yep. Cool. So you can distribute your power, distribute your exponent, if you have products. Not across the sum of difference. But, okay. but across a product, you can distribute it. Does that go for quotients, too? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So yeah, so we get divergence, which, which is uh, not totally intuitive. I mean, if you multiply a factorial by 4, it's a lot less than raising z factorial by 4. But this, this number is going to be so much bigger. Like If you think about 5 factorial versus 20 factorial, this is going to be way more than that. Like if you think about, so that, if we plug in a 5, so 5 factorial in the denominator raised to the fourth power versus 20 factorial. So the numerator would be 20 factorial. So this 5 factorial is going to be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 4 times. But if you just look at these terms over here, you've got the 5 factorial that's going to cancel at the end. So you basically have three 5 factorials up down here. But in the front, you have 20 times 19 times 18 times 17. Like that chunk is going to be a lot bigger than a 5 factorial. Definitely not in, it's definitely not intuitive. Because you might say to yourself, oh, this is acting like 
you know, like a, a, like a higher power polynomial. And this is just still another factorial. So it feels, you can convince yourself that it could go either way. But the fact is the numerator is going to be much larger than the denominator. You know, and if, not, if it's not 100% clear, if you can't reason it out, the best way to, you know. Let's let the decimals do it for you. Yeah, let the decimals do it for us. So let's just consider 20 factorial. That's that number. And let's do um, 5 factorial. And then let's raise that to the fourth power. What? So, just a little bit. yeah, exactly. So the power of 10 here up top is to the 18. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the power of 10 in the denominator is only 10 to the 8. And we only plugged in a 5. If we plugged in a 10 or a 20, this numerator is noticeably larger, even though it might not be obvious just you know, playing around with it a little bit. Desmos is a good way to convince yourself. All right, let's do this one. So the sine function, there's a couple of facts that are really important. I'm going to graph it in decimals just because that'll be more precise than me trying to point out what I'm going to try to point out. So let's take a look at uh, x and sine x. And then I'm going to zoom in. Okay, so there is x and sine x. And what you should be seeing is that x is always bigger than sine x as soon as we leave the origin. Are you seeing that? If we had to, we could come in here and really like do some funky stretching. And the fact is, as you keep zooming in, that green line is going to be above that sine function all the way. So x is bigger than sine x. Let me just try to draw a simple sketch of it here. So if we look at sine and we look at y equals x, y equals x is always going to be bigger than sine x. So that's a xy way to think of it. Here is a trig way to think of it. Let's draw a unit circle. And let's take a look at this angle theta right there. This is a unit circle, so the hypotenuse is 1. And what is the length of this vertical leg right there in a unit circle? What is that vertical leg in a unit circle? On a unit circle, it's a sine, oh, right? All right, sine and cosine. So, the, so this leg right here is sine. Oh, yeah, no. I thought you were saying a value. Not a number. If it is not a number, then that can't be a number. Yeah, that's why. It's like, yeah. Okay, you agree with that, that that vertical distance is sine of theta. That's what it means. It's the y-coordinate of the point in the unit circle. Does, it, now, does anybody know what the length of this arc is right there? So there's our point on the unit circle. Anyone know what the length of that arc is? It's not going to be a number. It's going to be a letter. What well, letter represents my number? Exactly. It's a letter. What, so what, what is the formula if you have a sector of a circle, you have theta, you have r, you have s, what's the equation that represents these three variables? S equals r theta. Yeah, s equals r theta. Now if you're on a unit circle, what's true? R is yeah, s equals theta if r is 1. So on a unit circle, 
the angle is theta radians, the arc is theta whatever, units of length, inches, feet, meters, centimeters, millimeters. And this gives us another visual for, since we're talking about theta instead of x, we see that theta is bigger than sine theta. Right? This curved reach, this curved piece of the circle, that's theta. This vertical piece is sine theta, that curved piece is bigger. So this gives us another visual for why theta is bigger than sine theta, or x is bigger than sine x, however you want to phrase it. It doesn't matter if you use an x or a theta or a k. All right. So just have that in the background. We know that that's true. So I claim that we should use b sub k 1 over k. This corresponds to a diverging harmonic. That diverges because it's the harmonic. And... Uh, that's actually what I meant to do. Thank you. That is exactly what I meant. To, I meant to just get rid of the sign. Yeah, thank you. I know, where'd the 9 go? That's significant. <laughs> that's significant. So here we have p equals 9, which is bigger than 1, so we actually have converge. Converge. So let's see what happens then. So sine, so if we want to show this is converging, we would want to show smaller than a known converging. So we would want to show that 1 over k to the 9 is less than 1 over k to the 9. And I guess actually the way we usually do it is I usually put the generic one up here just to be safe. So we want to show that a sub k is smaller than b sub k. I'm going to put a question mark there. And that's true instantly because theta is bigger than sine theta. It doesn't matter if the theta is 1 over k to the 9th or the sine or the or it's an x, doesn't matter. This says that sine of whatever is smaller than whatever. And whatever we put inside the sine, if it's smaller than uh, the identity. So this is true instantaneously. This is true because sine x is less than x. Right there, sine x is less than x. Uh, and now that means that what's true about this series then? Converge or diverge? So it's going to converge. So both are converging. So our b sub k series, when we chose it correctly, 1 over k to the 9, that's a convergent series. We've shown direct comparison that the series a sub k is smaller than the series b sub k smaller than converging converges. So both those series are converging. And this is just one of those VCTs that's a little different than most. Most of the time we're erasing constants and simplifying. We've had two DCTs now where we still compare to, uh, uh, we compare in a way that feels like we're taking away something significant. Here we took away the sine function. And the idea that it's not significant is because the sine function and x are really close together in here. So you know, whether you do x or whether you do sine x, if you're close to the origin, these are about the same. So all right. And as k is going up, this is close to the origin. 1 over k to the ninth gets close to 0. Does anyone remember the other series that we had that we used a comparison that for we used a direct comparison that wasn't quite as something with the natural log? Yes. So one over natural log of k. Yeah, that was the other one. We chose our b sub k. This one we chose to be one over k. And so we showed that this one died the a sub k series with the natural log diverged because that b sub k series with the 1 over k diverged. We can show that we showed this, that 1 over natural log of k is bigger than 1 over k because k is bigger than natural log of k. So we have those two where we did use the direct comparison test for a, sh for a form that looks a little different than what we normally use it for. 
Okay. And our final slide. All right. What test there? We're going root. Root makes the most sense. So we're going to take the limit of the kth root here and the limit of the kth root. Uh, let's just take the kth root right away. Let's not write that extra step in there at this stage of the game. So we divide minus k squared by k, and we get that. And this looks like heck a lot of a lot like what we did earlier. We said, oh, well, can we be creative? And the answer is yes, we can. We can take the minus 1 in the exponent position, and we can apply it so that we have that. This is the limit of 1 plus 10 over k to the k. And what is the limit there? e to the 10. Yeah, e to the 10. e to the 10. And so what's our conclusion for the root test here? Diverge because that is greater than 1. So this is bigger than 1. And that is all we need to conclude that that series is a divergent series. That series diverges. All right, last one. You all give it a shot. I'll give you two minutes to get started on it. Let me point one thing out. This is. 4 to the k to the 2. This is not 4 to the k squared. Right, 4 to the k squared would simplify to 4 to the 2k. And that's not what this is. It's 4 to the k squared. Power Tower-ish. Tricky part's going to be canceling, trying to figure out the cancellation pattern for the 4 to the stuff. Remember your law of exponents. If you have 4 to the a plus b, it's 4 to the a times 4 to the b. k plus 1 squared up in the exponent position, you want to foil that out. That's going to be our gateway to canceling that, those powers of 4. We're simplifying, I guess. They're not going to cancel totally that. But we can simplify them. Step two up here. And I'll 
stack the K's next to each other. I think you're probably okay with the K factorial cancellation. So the tricky piece here, which is not that tricky with your laws of exponents, you know that that left, upper left factor can be rewritten like this. laws of exponents. If we multiply two exponential expressions that have the same base, we add the exponents. So we can go backwards there and pull off a factor of 4 to the k squared. And then those will in fact cancel. Now we'll get those canceling. And what do you think the limit of this is? infinity because the numerator is an exponential and the denominator is a polynomial. Let's do it all the way out though just to make sure. We'll use L'Hopital's rule. So right now this is infinity over infinity. So that's L'Hopital's rule. We'll take the derivative of top and bottom. All right. The derivative of the denominator is 1. How about the derivative of the numerator? What's the derivative of 4 to the 2k plus 1? So, uh, so it's itself. Times times itself. Itself times the derivative of the exponent times the natural log of the base. So it's all those things, yeah. That is the derivative of an exponential. Itself times the derivative of the exponent times the natural log of the base. That one is meaningless downstairs, so what's this limit? Infinity. All right. So this was the ratio test. What is our conclusion for the ratio test in this case? Diverge. Greater than 1, which implies diverge. So for the root and the ratio test, if you get an infinite limit that or that is great, that's considered greater than one. So you don't have to have a positive real in this case. So we had those two cases, the integral test and the limit comparison test where we had to get a positive real. Here, infinity, don't need a positive real as long as it's bigger than one, then we're good. All right, let's take our 10 minute break and then we'll dive into some power series. So the moment we've all been waiting for, when one infinite series of numbers just doesn't feel like it's enough, let's go to an infinite number of infinite series of numbers. Okay. So we're going to start by talking about a power series. And so a power series is a non-ending polynomial. So in other words, we're thinking of a power series as a series of powers of x. So that's what this is representing. It's just a series of powers of x. So some folks call it an unending polynomial. Some call it an infinite polynomial. Regardless, it is an unending polynomial. It goes on forever and ever. So. There are two ways that we usually designate the so-called center. Up here in the top one, we would say that this center is 0, so we just don't put any parentheses with no subtraction in there. So this one has a center of 0. And this one has a center of A. Center is A. So it's just like a normal shifting thing that you saw in college algebra. When you did the parabolas, the a times x minus h squared plus k, same kind of thing. This is just a shift by a units. All right, so now 
this first couple of slide, this first slide in particular, we're just trying to get the bigger picture before we get into the nitty gritty on well, where did these power series come from? What are they for? So again, power series, polynomial that goes on forever. And I've got a couple examples here before we start from scratch. So this is this is the power series for e to the x. So for e to the x, the power series is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, et cetera. And then here is our sigma notation for it. And then we're going to notice this interval to the right. So that interval to the right tells us the interval of convergence. And so here's what I mean that there is an infinite number of numerical series. If you plug in any x value here, you get a numerical series, which is what we did in chapter 10. That's what we've been doing. Series of numbers, numerical series. So if we wanted to get e to the 1, this is the power series representation for e to the x. So if we just plug in a 1, we are going to get a numerical series representation for e. So this is e right there. That's e. If you wanted, that's e as a numerical series, infinite series. If you wanted e squared, you just plug in a 2 for the x, etc. And this is basically how our devices calculate these types of things. If you type e into your calculator, it can do the, it can add and subtract and multiply really easily. So we just have to figure out how many terms to add together. We'll do a little bit more of that later today. There's going to be an error or a remainder. Um, but that's what E looks like as an infinite series, at least one representation. Now notice that this infinite series, this power series, is centered at 1 versus centered at 0. So we have all these x minus 1s everywhere. And we don't multiply it out. We don't do any foiling. It's very rare that we ever simplify coefficients with power series. Very rare. Usually we just leave them in there. There's going to be factorials and constants. And um, leaving them unsimplified allows us to see it, the pattern more easily. Oh, I have a typo here. This should be x minus 1 right there. That should be x minus 1, uh, not just x. So usually when you don't simplify everything, you can come up with this general form or the pattern is just more easily discernible. So typically we're not going to cancel things. So that's what we think. When you hear the word power series, that's what you should be thinking. Now, there's an analogy that I like to use with power series. Um, and that is this. So a power series is an unending polynomial. So we just imagine this whole cloud of unending polynomials. Only some of them will have representations as common functions. There's going to be many more. You can imagine, oh, what if I put a 5 in front of the x squared, and put a 10 in front of the x cubed, and a pi in front of the x to the 1,000? You can imagine creating a whole bunch of unending polynomials that aren't going to be equal to a common function, like sine or cosine or e or log or something. So it's only a finite set, it's a small set in general, that we have that represent functions that we're familiar with. And it reminds me of the, the irrational numbers. If you look at the real line and you pick off an irrational number, there's very few of them that have a nice abbreviated name, if you will, like square root of 2, or square root of 3, or square root of 5, or you know, whatever. Most of them are going to be these crazy, unending decimals that have no name to them other than that approximation with that weird decimal expansion. And most of them don't have a nice, concise square root of 2, square root of 3, pi, e, right? So it's the same thing with the power series. There's an infinite cloud of power series, and we just pull down and use a few of them that are equal to common functions. So that's kind of the general big picture for power series. Question. I yeah, don't go for it. really understand like how the e to the x equaling like the one plus. That's what we're gonna do. 
Oh, so we're not supposed to understand why. No, this no, okay. this is the big picture. Okay. This, so what we're going to do is under, that's where we're going. We're going to try to understand it. So one thing that you did in Calc 1 is that you approximated E with 1 plus X. That's called the tangent line. 1 plus x is the tangent line. It's the best linear approximation to e of x. So this is, I guess, a good, way to talk, good time to say this. So when we go out one more term, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, that's going to be the best quadratic approximation for e of x. And as you keep going out, you're getting better and better approximations. In Calc 1, all you did was the linear approximation, which the linear approximation actually sucks unless you're super, super close to your center. So let's check out this. Might as well. I think I've got a Taylor polynomial here. <laughs> so let me just give you a, a visual for what's happening with these power series. So the black curve there is e to the x. Uh, where are my ends? There are my ends. Okay, so there's e to the x. There is the tangent line at the origin. There's the tangent line. So it's a pretty good approximation if you're like within epsilon of the origin. If you're a gnat living right at the origin, that's pretty decent. But as soon as you get out here, this approximation is terrible, right? Like if we come out here to whatever that number is, 5 over 2. That's a pretty terrible approximation because there's the error right there, right? But here is the best quadratic approximation. Bing! Now we have a much wider interval where the, where the black curve and, the, and the, poly, the quadratic are matching, right? You can see that it matches a lot better. So now here is the third order approximation. And the idea with these power series Taylor polynomials is what we're going to talk about in a minute, is the farther you go out, the wider your interval of convergence gets, and the better the function matches. And if you go to infinity, you get the infinite polynomial. That will exactly match the function. So let's take a look at the sine function. So here's sine. There's its power series. And let's do the same thing. So, so we'll come back here. There's the best linear approximation to sine. Yeah, it's great if you're within a stone's throw of the origin, but as soon as you get far away, it's terrible. So then you start tacking on extra terms, and it just wraps itself around it. So these power series, the further out you go, the better the approximation. And that's how our devices calculate for our our screens, like our um, calculators. That's what they're doing. They're, doing they're using polynomial approximations to whatever you're typing into the calculator. So let's start from scratch. This is back in Calc 1. Let's try to figure out how we get those terms for e to the x. How do we get them? Well, this is all you did in Calc 1. You figured out the tangent line. There is the tangent line right there. Tangent line is the value of the function, right there. And then you add the slope, which is the derivative, times x minus a. And that is the equation of your tangent line. So that's the tangent line that you did in Calc 1. Two super important pieces that have to be true for this to be the tangent line. The value of your approximation and the value of the function you're approximating better match at A. If your tangent line's at A, then the tangent line at A and the function at A match, right? They have the same y value. The second thing that's important is that they have the same slope. And by definition, we say the slope of a curve is the, sl is the slope of the tangent line at the curve. So for a tangent line, you're thinking values match <coughs> and slopes match. Well, now we want to up the ante. Tangent line is only good if you're you know, within a stone's throw of A. So we want to up the ante. We want a better approximation. So we go to the quadratic approximation. So the quadratic approximation is the parabola of best fit. And there you can see that, oh gosh, we have a much better interval of convergence right away. 
Now we can go much further to the left and get a good, decent match between the function and this approximating polynomial. So when a, we're thinking about a quadratic approximation, we're thinking the values match, we're thinking the slopes match, and we're thinking that concavity matches. So now we have value, value, slope, and concavity all match. <coughs> so in other words, for the parabola to be the parabola of best fit, there's value, there's slope, and there's concavity. All of those must match. So we have value, we have slope, and we have concavity. So they all match. So let's see. How did I build this polynomial here? Well, here's the tangent line right there. So that's the same as the previous slide. That's the tangent line. f of a plus f prime a, x minus a. And this is going to be our quadratic term. So to get to the quadratic approximation, we start with the linear and then add a quadratic term. Now we have to add a quadratic term so that all this stuff is true down here. So it has to have an x minus a in it because we need, when we plug in a for x, we need all this to disappear so that p2 of a equals f of a. It has to match at our point of tangency. So it, the quadratic term has to have an x minus a in there so that we can get rid of it if we plug in a. All right, and then it's got to be to the 2 because it's quadratic. And then we have this mystery thing right here. We need to figure out, well, what would the coefficient be? We see the coefficient over here of our linear term. The coefficient is f prime of a. So now we need to figure out the coefficient for the quadratic term. So that's what we're trying to find. What's that? Can we establish a pattern or something? Well, let's see. So let's see if we can do the following. OK. So here is the polynomial that we say is going to be the polynomial of best fit, the second order polynomial of best fit, best parabola, best quadratic approximation, a million ways to say it. Let's see if our three properties hold. So, or let's see what it takes to make them hold. So we want value, slope, and concavity to all match. So first thing I'm going to do is highlight constants. f of a is a constant. x is the variable. a is a constant. It's <coughs> f prime of a is a constant. Right? That's the slope. a, of course, is a constant. And then a is a constant and c2 is a constant. So let's see. When we take the first derivative of this expression, derivative of a constant is 0, so that goes away. This constant here is distributed to the x, and it's distributed to the a. Well, when that constant is distributed to another constant, it's derivative of 0. But how about this? What would be the, dis what would be the derivative right here? When we distribute this constant to that x, it's going to be f prime of a. It's going to be whatever that constant is. right? This is like, think of it as mx. The slope of mx is m. The derivative of mx is m. If you have a linear expression, the derivative is the coefficient. OK, so now we come over to here. Quadratic. How do we differentiate this? We have to use a power rule. The 2 comes down. We get 2c2 times x minus a to the 1. And then we multiply by the derivative of what's inside, which is just 1. So now that is the first derivative of our p2. Now let's keep going. Let's get down to the second derivative. So that's a constant right there. Keep that in mind. That's a constant. So when we differentiate this p2 prime to get p2 double prime, well, that's a constant, so its derivative is 0. That's going to go away. Derivative of that is 0. So now we come over here. And if we were to distribute this 2c2, we distribute it to the x, we distribute it to the a. Well, when that constant is distributed to another constant, that's going to give a derivative of 0. But when we have 2c2x, what's the derivative of that? 2c2, right there. 
And now we isolate C2. So C2 is going to be P double prime of x over 2. And we, as a condition, we said, hey, the second derivative of P2 better match the second derivative of the function. So then we're going to find our C2 in this way. Our C2 is going to be, oops, I put, well, of x there, but down here it's going to be of a. So there it is. That's it. So that's how we get the best quadratic approximation. And then we can do a similar argument to get the best cubic approximation. We're basically going to add another term that's going to have an x minus a cubed in it. And so we'll have a C3 in front of this. Then we have to find that. And what we really are hoping is that there's a nice distinct pattern that's going to build all these coefficients so that we're not constantly doing things that are not related. Hopefully we can come up with a nice clean pattern, which of course there is. This is math, not pottery. So let's do it. So let's find linear approximation, quadratic approximation, and then we're going to approximate the given quantity. So we've got a function, 1 over x. And now, obviously, these first few examples, you can just type into your calculator 1 over 1.05. You don't need an approximation for this. You could just do it. But the first few that you don't need approximations for, we do so that we can get into the habit of what's happening. So super easy examples. So here's what I recommend. Put your function and the derivatives over here on the left and go vertically. Because we're going to need what we've seen, and I'll write that as x to the negative 1. What we've seen is that to get to the second order approximation, we need the second derivative of the function. OK, so we have to go all the way down to two derivatives. So we're going to do that. So that's going to be minus x to the minus 2. That's going to be 2x to the minus 3. So those are our derivatives. And let me write the polynomial over here in general just to remind you what we need. So the second order polynomial is going to be first, it's going to be f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And then it's f double prime of a divided by 2 times x minus a squared. So that's what we're building. So notice that we need the function at a, the derivative at a, and the second derivative at a. So we have to plug whatever our center is, which we're given a center of 1. So we've got to plug that in. So let's plug it into all three. So you doing these in columns is really helpful to keep things straight. Especially when we are finding like a fifth order approximation. <coughs> All right, so now let's build it. So P sub 1 starts with f of a plus f prime of a, which is negative 1, times x minus a, a is 1. So this is the best linear approximation, aka the tangent line. So there's the tangent line. Now our quadratic approximation, and you can multiply this out if you want. In general, we don't really do that with these. Maybe in the simplest of cases we could do it, but as soon as we get beyond the first couple examples, we're not going to multiply things out. So let's just not multiply it out here. Um, so p sub 2 is going to be identically p sub 1. And then we just have to add our quadratic term. So there's our quadratic term. We take the second derivative of the function, evaluate it at a, we get 2. We then have to divide by 2. And then we have x minus the center, again, that's 1, squared. So that is our second order approximation right there. The only simplification that we would do here is that we cancel that and turn that into a 1. 
So that's our second order of polynomial. I, I, have, to get, um, I, I have to go back a little yep. bit. Um, F double prime of A yep. divided by 2. How did you divide by 2? That's what we got right here. A... So we had to figure out. So here's the polynomial in okay. general. We said, what's C sub 2? We did the first and second derivative. And we, got, we solved for C2, and it's going to be P2 double prime over 2. And we, and we said that we want to have P double prime match F double prime, so we have this. And then we want to evaluate it at A to get the coefficient. A. Okay. Because what we, so when we take our derivatives here, when we get down to our second derivative, we're getting all the way down to this. So we want the second derivative at A to match P double prime at A. And so for that to happen, we replace the C2 with F double prime of A over 2. Oh. So that's going to be, that's the coefficient right there. It's this expression evaluated at A. Oh. We'll give us that coefficient. So it's kind of like you know, this first derivative at A, uh, that's what allows us to get P prime of A to be equal to F prime of A. Because right here, if we replace this X with an A, that goes away and we'll get P prime equals F prime. Oh, okay. So same idea down here. We're going to want to replace, when we replace this with F double prime of A over 2, we take two derivatives, then we're going to get it to match. Now, we're not going to do that in general for the third and the fourth. We're going to see a pattern and then just jump to the pattern. <coughs> so now it says approximate. So let's approximate. Let's use black. Okay, so P1 of 1.05. So P1 of x, x is the denominator, so we're plugging in a 1.05. That's going to equal 1 minus, and let's see, we do 1.05 minus 1, so that's 0 0.05. So this is our first order approximation. Our second order approximation, P sub 2 of 1.05, we plug it in to this one, we're going to get 1 minus, plug it in 1.05, so 1 minus 0 0.05 plus Plug it in here, and we get again 0.05, but we square it. And then let's go plug it in and get our approximation. Ooh. Yeah. So we have. 0.95 plus 0 0.05 squared. So that is our second order approximation, 0.9525. And let's notice how close they are. So again, this is a Simple example because we can just actually type this in. We don't, you know, we know what the value of this function is. So that is the actual value of the function. Put that over here. Okay, so. When we look at the first order approximation, it matches the two decimal places. The third order approximation is out to three decimal places. And the higher the order we go, the more and more it's going to wrap around this number and get closer and closer to the exact value. I uh, didn't ask for error here, though. No. OK. All right, so now let's try another one, unless you have a question on any of those steps. All right, we'll build one more together, and then you all can try one. On your own. So I'm going to start out with the function here. The function is the root of x. 
And we want to approximate the square root of 3.9. So they're choosing a center of 4. So we're going to, and we want a third, a second order polynomial. So we have to go down to the second derivative. So I'm just going to go down to two derivatives here in the left column. All right, so there are our derivatives. And then we have to evaluate these derivatives at the center. So we're going to have f of 4, that's going to be 2. f prime of 4, that's going to be 1 fourth. And f double prime of 4, that's going to be, let's see, the square root of 4 is 2, 2 cubed is 8. But that minus puts it in the denominator, so we have minus 1 over 32. So that is the information we need to now construct the polynomial. So the, these Taylor polynomials are constructed. <clears throat> Let me uh, grab this again just as we have it as a model, just so you're copy. Okay, so let's build it. <clears throat> so our first order polynomial is just the first two terms. So if this is P1, why don't we just build P2 and we can isolate P1 as necessary? Because it's all, it's all, there's this redundancy that happens. So we start with F of A, that's right there. So 2 plus f prime of a multiplied by x minus the center. So there's our tangent line. That's our linear approximation. To turn it into a quadratic approximation, we keep going. We take the second derivative of 4 and divide by 2. So that's going to be negative 1 over 64 times x minus 4 squared. So there is p sub 2, and p sub 1 is built in. It's right here. There's p sub 1. OK. So then let's go ahead and do our approximations. We want the approximation of 3.9. So I'll, put, I'll call out the first order polynomial, the tangent line. That's going to be 2 plus one-fourth times, plugging in 3.9 there, we get negative one-tenth. 3.9 minus 4 is a tenth. So we get 2 minus one-fortieth, which if we're giving an exact value, we'll get an approximation in a minute. We're going to get 79 over 40. <coughs> Whatever that is, we'll find out soon. P2 of 3.9 is going to be that 79 over 40. It's going to be whatever P1 is. But then we have to add the quadratic term. So we've got that front, and we've got the linear part. Now it's going to be 1 over 64 multiplied by, again, 3.9 minus 4 is negative 1 tenth. But we're squaring it. And let's see what we get. Trusty Desmos. So P1's approximation, 79 divided by 40 is that. Then we do 79 divided by 40 minus 1 over 64 multiplied by point. Well, I'll just write it out. Negative one tenth squared. So we have that. And we're trying to approximate the square root. Whoops. Trying to approximate that. So now we have all three right there. Bring it over. All 
right, so once again, we see that here's our target number right there. And the first order approximation, the tangent line, got us out to two decimals. And this gets us all the way out to five decimals with just a second order approximation. We're out to five decimal places. So if we, you can imagine how fast these approximations get pretty darn good. So building Taylor polynomials will get us there pretty quickly. Okay, any questions before you try another one? Before you try one? On your own. All right, go for it. Oh, crap. Not yet. I should have had you do that one. That's all right. You'll do plenty of them in a minute. Okay, so the pattern we've seen, so what we did thus far is that we went out to the second order right there. That's where we went. And we saw that it was f double prime of a over 2. Now, we're not going to go through finding c sub 3, but when you go through the same thing that we did for c sub 2 to get to c sub 3, you will show that c sub 3 is going to turn into certainly the third derivative of f at a. And we were thinking, well, maybe the derivative the third derivative will have a 3 in the denominator, but it turns out it has a 6 in the denominator. And if you go out to the fourth coefficient, it turns out that the fourth derivative at a has a 4 times 3 times 2 in the denominator. And so we see that, oh, it's not just the power in the denominator, it's actually the power factorial in the denominator. So our coefficients in general we will divide by whatever that derivative value is, divide by that factorial. So this is the general process to find approximations, which we refer to as Taylor polynomials. Taylor polynomials are nothing more than approximations to functions that have derivatives. Obviously, the function has to be differentiable to take these derivatives and get the coefficients. So that is going to be our general process. The coefficient will be derivative at a divided by k factorial. So here is a picture of what we have already looked at. The black curve is e to the x. First order polynomial is there, second order, third order, it just gets better and better as you go further and further out. That's it. That's the concept. It gets better and better the further out you go. How do you go out further? You take one more derivative. So let's do another example. So you all work on this one. So this one they want us to go out to five. So don't bother writing P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. Just write P5. We know that P1 is the first part, P2 is the next part, et cetera. So do it with an order of 5. And the center is 0. It's e to the minus x. So you need to get out to the fifth derivative. A Taylor polynomial of order 5 requires the fifth derivative. say we'll be skipped? Like what steps are we skipping? Uh, don't bother writing each of these individually because P1 is just the first part of P2. So if you have to get the P5, just write out P5 and then you can kind of isolate and say here's P1, here's P2, here's P3, here's P4. But they're all subsets of, the, it's like a Russian shell thing, okay. Russian dolls.
So I'll just lag behind you guys. So there's the set of derivatives. Just double check, make sure yours are right. And then you have to evaluate all those derivatives at the center. Center is zero here. P sub 5, so that's the fifth order approximation. We're going to start with this initial constant right there. So we go 1 and then minus, and then it's going to be x minus 0 to the 1. And that's going to be plus a 1 over 2 factorial times x squared. And then minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed. And then we go to the f fourth derivative right there. That's a 1. We're going to have a 4 factorial x to the 4. And then f, fifth derivative of f at 0, negative 1. So negative 1, 5 factorial x to the 5. So there is your fifth order approximation. Question, why are we not using the e to the x's, to the negative x's in there. The polynomial is built by evaluating the derivatives at the center. So when we evaluate our derivatives, we're getting constants. So what are we plugging those constants into? What formula is that again? The uh, um, that one. So we're going to, so we're, our pattern is going to be that the coefficients are the corresponding derivative divided by the corresponding derivative factorial. So, yeah, we'll do a couple. It'll start to, start to make more and more sense as we do more and more. So this part right here, there's p sub 1. There's p sub 2, etc. So p sub 2 ends at x squared, p sub 3 ends at x cubed, p sub 4 ends at x to the fourth, p sub 5 ends at x to the fifth. So that is our approximating polynomial for e to the negative x. All right, go ahead and start this one. Same thing, let's find p sub 5. This p sub 5, and let's center it at pi over 6. And there's the function we're starting with, cosine. If we want p sub 5, we know we've got to go all the way down to the fifth derivative. Right back.
start flying through some derivatives here. Let me know if you're stuck on any of them. Anybody have questions on any of these derivative values? These all make sense? Okay, so there are our derivative values. Now we just go through the constructive process of building the polynomial. So we start with the tangent line, so p sub 5. We start with the tangent line, which is the initial constant minus 1 half times x minus pi over 6. So there's our approximation, first order approximation. That's the tangent line. And okay. wait, the question, so is it, the, is it f of x plus f prime? It's f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a to the 1. So f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a to the 1. And as of right now, that's equal to p sub 5? That's p sub 1. Yeah, p sub yeah one. that's p sub 1. So then and now we're going to get to p sub 2. We Oh, that's a negative. So we go to the next coefficient. That's minus root 3 over 2. I'm going to leave it in the numerator, and then we're going to have a 2 factorial times x minus pi over 6 to the 2. And here's where I'm, we're not going to simplify these. We'll just leave them. It's much better to leave them if you're trying to find patterns. You don't want to multiply them all. It's a pain in the neck. So that's p sub 2 out to the second order. And now let's get to the p sub 3. So p sub 3, we add the next constant, 1 half. But we have to divide by 3 factorial, and then we have x minus pi over 6 to the 3. So that's p sub 3. To get to p sub 4, we go to the next constant, root 3 over 2. What do we have to divide root 3 over 2 by for the fourth term? 4 factorial. 4 factorial for the fourth order term. Factorial, x minus pi over 6 to the fourth. And then our fifth order term, negative 1 half divided by 5 factorial times x minus pi over 6 to the fifth. There we have it. That is the fifth order polynomial, which is just this bootstrapping way of getting from one term to the next. So this is the Taylor polynomial of order 5, centered at 5 or 6. Uh, yeah? And like on the test, would you expect us to estimate something using this? Or just... Not this big. Oh. Not this big. Maybe one of those earlier ones. Yeah, trying to plug in 4 or 5, yeah, that would be a pain. I wouldn't do that to you. I would not make you suffer that hard. Um, what's scale from 1 to 10, how much harder does it get after that? After what we just did? Yeah. What we just did is trivial. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very procedural. Right? We take derivatives, and all we have to do is add up the next term, the next term, the next term. So that part's it's procedural. We're not to the heady part yet. Gotcha. Cool. So it'll get hard. It'll get a lot harder. Fun. Section 1 is the easy section. Section one is the easy one. Okay, so here we have the tangent of negative 0.1. We want to approximate that. 
So the function that we're using is tangent of x. And the a value that we're going to choose is an a value that's very close to this that we can use to evaluate the function really easily. Zero. That a value will be 0. Because we know tan of 0 is 0. So that's a good approximation center point. <coughs> OK, so it says order 3. So if we have an order 3, we have to go all the way out to the third derivative. So there's f, then f prime is secant squared. And then f double prime, that's going to be 2 secant to the 1, using the power rule, that first part. Bring down the 2, subtract 1, and now we have to multiply by the derivative of the base. The derivative of the base is secant tangent, so that's going to add another factor of secant and then put a tangent there. <coughs> Now we want a third order, so we have to go one more derivative. Yep, product rule. So the first function, 2 secant squared, that's the first function. The derivative of the second function, the second function is tangent. Its derivative is secant squared. So that's going to just make this secant squared go up to a secant to the fourth. So that is first derivative second plus the derivative of the first times the second. The derivative of the first is 4 secant to the 1 times the derivative of secant, which is secant tangent, and then multiplied by the second adds a second secant in there. So that's our third derivative. And then we evaluate them each at our center of 0. So f of 0 is 0. Hmm. f prime of 0 is 1. Secant of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Secant is the reciprocal. So secant is 1 also. How about second derivative? Yeah, zero again. And third derivative? One. Close. One. Two. So the secant value will be one, and then one times two is two. This part will be zero over there. So now we're ready to build P sub three. So P sub three. We start with our initial constant. 0, don't need to put it. Or maybe you want to put it as a placeholder, maybe that'll help. And then plus, next constant, 1 times x to the 1 divided by 1 factorial. The next constant, oh again it's 0, so 0x zero squared over 2 factorial if we want to just sort of put it as a pattern. And then our next constant, 2x cubed over 3 factorial. So that is our p sub 3. And of course, both these terms, you don't have to write them in there. Those are both gone. So there is our polynomial. If it's a really short polynomial, if you want to simplify it, there's certain cases where maybe my math lab might ask you to simplify it. I don't think it forces you to, but. So that would be our simplified polynomial. Could, could you really quickly just like rewrite that, but like fill in every single like zero and one and, and whatnot? I, there's the zero. I thought I did, like, right? Well, like zero plus one, one. times x minus zero inside parentheses, just to kind of like visualize it. So this. So here are the coefficients. Let's put them in different color. So there is 0, 1, 0, 2. So those are the coefficients right there. Oh, OK. You see it? Yeah. So, the, so we sort of jump through one at a time. So that coefficient, and then next coefficient, next coefficient, next coefficient. 
And then we look up here at the power, or the, the order of the derivative. So for the third order derivative, we have to have a 3 and a 3 factorial. For second order, we have to have a 2 and a 2 factorial. For first order, we have to have a 1 and a 1 factorial. Oh, right, because it's always like x minus a to that power of the... Yep, okay. exactly, exactly. <clears throat> okay, so now in this one it says find the absolute error. Okay, so let's do that. What does that mean? Okay, so we're approximating at negative point 0.1, so let's get our polynomial at negative point 0.1, so p sub 3 of negative point 0.1, that's going to be negative point 0.1 plus 1 third times negative point 0.1 cubed. So let's go to Desmos and get our approximation here. So we're going to have negative 0.1 plus 1 third times negative 0.1 cubed. And what were we doing tangent of negative 0.1? So tangent of negative 0.1. So there's the exact value. Okay, so there's the approximation, there's the exact value, and they wanted the error. So the absolute error is the difference between the true value and the approximation. So all we're going to do is take these things and subtract them. So we're going to do that, minus parentheses, and I'm going to take the prox approximation, dump it in there, and that's our error. That is the error. So like on the example, it'd just be like give the error to the, like, I don't know, eighth decimal point. Yeah, exactly. I would say where to stop. Right, yeah, because, yeah. What's so, quick question, was it? Uh, absolute error, so we'll take the absolute value of this. Okay. Was that your question? Oh, so I guess it doesn't matter what you want to do. Correct. So the absolute error, so when you're finding remainders, remainders can be positive or negative, so a lot of times we'll say find the absolute error. So if we say the absolute error is 0.2, then that means we could be above by 0.2 or below by 0.2. And so our absolute error is going to be the uh, absolute value of that, so 0.000, oh my gosh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros, uh, and then 1, and let's just go out to 9. Uh, so there's 6, and then 3, 3, 9, approximately. We'll approximate the approximate error. <clears throat> that all makes sense? So then this is that number right there. This is the actual value. This one's the approx. And this is error. Squeeze in one more with the natural log function. So for this natural log function, we're going to start with f of x equals log x. What do you think we're going to use for an a if we want to approximate that? Is there a, an x value that we know the log of that's real close to 105? One. Yeah, we're going to let a equal 1. Because we know natural log of 1 is 0. <laughs> we don't know many other natural log values. <laughs> natural log of E. Okay, so um, I forget, did it say third order? What were we doing? Yeah, third order. Okay, so we have to get down to three derivatives.
we evaluate the function and all these derivatives at the center. So those are the values of the derivative. Values of the derivatives. So the polynomial P sub 3 of x will be, starts with the 0, 0 plus 1 times what? x minus 1. x minus 1. Minus 1 times what? x minus 1 what? I guess I don't need the 1. Power on x minus 1? 2. 2 divided by 2 factorial. Actually, I guess I want that 1 out there so I can divide by 2 factorial. OK. Last term, 2 over 3 factorial times x minus 1 cubed. So there is our P3, P sub 3. So then we're going to figure out p sub 3 of x. So we want natural log of x, so we're going to plug in a 1.05. Plugging in 1.05 here gives 0 0.05 minus 1 over 2 times 0 0.05 squared plus and simplify this on the way since we're going to go plug it into the calculator. So there is our approximation. <coughs> Run over to Desmos. So our approximation is 0 0.05 minus 1 half times 0 0.05 squared plus a third times 0 0.05 raised to the third u raised to the third. And we're doing natural log of, is it 1.05? Yes. So there we have the approximation, the actual value, and then the error we're just going to take the actual value. Oops, didn't like that. Control copy, control paste, minus parentheses. And we'll put this inside the parentheses. So here we have it again. So same kind of setup. This is the approximation. Here is our actual. And then here is our error. And then if we take the absolute value to get the absolute error, we just do that to get the absolute error. You see it? Five zeros and then one five zero two. Five zeros. All right, let's see. So, what's the page? Oh, yeah. All right, we'll talk about the last slide on, um, on Tuesday. The last slide has to do with some remainder conversation. 
We'll finish that up on Tuesday, and we'll jump into 11.2 and 11.3. Please read those over the weekend, because we start going like this. So definitely read ahead. Read ahead, read ahead. We are not quite in the home stretch, but you should treat this like the home stretch. Be studying a ton. Be studying a ton. Let's get this. Let's get through this, man. Let's get through this.